Hi everyone. Good evening. Welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Rukmini Banerjee and I am one of your three Athenaeum Fellows for the year. It was once said, Rome will exist as long as the Colosseum does. When the Colosseum falls, so will Rome. When Rome falls, so will the world. Today, the Rome once described is no longer, but the, question is, but the world is still enchanted with the concepts and questions raised by the Roman Empire. And to shed some light and clarify our understanding of Rome, we have this today, Professor Michelle Rene Salzman. Professor Salzman is a professor of history at the University of California, Riverside. Her research primarily focuses on social and religious history in the late antiquity. She is especially interested in the Roman Empire and strongly emphasizes the use of material evidence to explain the past. Professor Saltzman has published four books and co-edited three others. She has been the recipient of many prestigious awards, including fellowships at the, Institute for, at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton University and the American Academy in Rome. Professor Saltzman was previously elected Vice President for Programs for the Society of Classical Studies from 2015 to 2018 and was a trustee for the Council of the School of Classical Studies to the American Academy in Rome from 2016 to 2019. She is also an Associate Editor for Studies in Late Antiquity. Today, Professor Salzman will address why traditional explanations for the decline and fall of Rome are flawed and will explore how its trajectory and story can be reframed. During her talk, Professor Salzman will reference her recent book, The Falls of Rome, Crises and Resilience and Resurgence in Late Antiquity. The book was published in September 2021 by Cambridge University Press. Reviewers have coined it a masterful and meticulous study of the ways Rome's elites rose to answer the diverse crises that shook the city from the late third through the early seventh century. Before we get started, a few quick reminders. Please take this time to silence and put away your cell phones. We have an amazing lecture for you today. Be present and get ready to engage in dialogue and ask thoughtful questions. As usual, video and audio recording by the audience is strictly prohibited. Welcome to the Athenaeum. First, I want to thank you for that lovely introduction, and I also want to uh, thank Shane Bjornley for the invitation, uh, and also uh, Priya for all the wonderful arrangements. It's really great to, uh, to be here to talk to you about um, room, uh, a subject that I'm really fascinated with. Can you all hear me okay? Okay, great. Uh, well, wonderful. So, um, the lecture today, I'm looking forward to the comments after our discussion at, at, at the um, dinner table. I'm looking forward to the questions at the end because there are, I think, lessons from the Western Roman Empire for today. Indeed. So, I'm going to begin um, with this image. It's one that may be familiar to you, and the headline actually came out of the New York Times, May 1st, 2020. And you can see that it's easy for journalists and historians to compare modern crises like the pandemic to the sack of Rome and to interpret events in light of this paradigm of the decline and fall of Rome, just as this reporter did. But since Edward Gibbon published his famous multi-volume history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire in, uh, uh, in the 18th century, Historians, artists, and intellectuals have engaged in a lively debate about the utility of this framework for to understand the last centuries of the Western Roman Empire. So too, they debate Gibbon's interpretation of these centuries as a result of the Germanic invasions, the quote, triumph of barbarism. And many historians, as you may know, um, uh, uh, also um, talk about Gibbon's idea uh, that, that the spread of Christianity undermined Rome's civic values and institutions. Modern books like Brian Ward Perkins, uh, The Fall of Rome and the End of Civilization, um, and Peter Heather's The Fall of the Roman Empire, A New History of Rome and the Barbarian Invasions. These books have periodically revived Gibbon's influential interpretive framework by similarly arguing that the Germanic invasions put an end to Rome. This view of the barbarians as the reason for Rome's fall, what I refer to as a catastrophist perspective, is famously at odds with, 
at odds with an alternative understanding of these centuries by historians like Peter Brown and Walter Pohl. Since the 1970s, these historians, those are referred to as continuists, these have argued for the ongoing vitality of Rome's legal and cultural institutions, even in the face of religious and social change. Nor would these continuists accept Gibbon's idea that Christianity destroyed Rome's strong military or its civic virtues and institutions. In my view, neither of these approaches captures the creative resilience of this period from roughly 300 to 700 AD, the period now most commonly referred to as late antiquity. The individuals and collective choices made by men and women during these pivotal three centuries made a difference. So, so to move beyond these two well-known paradigms for understanding this period, I focus instead in my recent book on the leadership of the elite who contested to rebuild Rome, the city and its empire, following military and political disasters. I emphasize not the collapse of Rome, nor its simple continuation, but rather its resilience. The experiences, ideals, and expectations of the leading elites of Rome as they responded to successive crises were significant factors in explaining the, the recovery of the city and its empire. Now I focus on the city of Rome and not on other places in the empire for several good reasons. First, the city of Rome's influence had shaped the outlines of its Mediterranean empire since the, at least the third century BC, and it continued to do so into late antiquity. Moreover, Rome was still the largest city in the Western Mediterranean and an imperial capital with a resident aristocracy and long established institutions like the Senate that had enabled Rome to rule an overseas empire. These same institutions enabled Rome to rule uh, even as the Western Empire faced crises. So the city, Rome, remained in late, into late antiquity, in the words of Robert Marcus, the quote, head, center, and sum of the world, end quote. In my recently published book, uh, The Falls of Rome, uh, I examined five dates associated with specific political and military crises that ancient and modern historians have considered critical for understanding Rome's decline and fall. I devoted a chapter to each crisis. <coughs> the first major political and military crisis that overtook the city was the civil war between Constantine and Maxentius. It was fought outside the walls of the city in 312. With the victory of Constantine, pagan senators were faced with a choice. Should they work with this newly triumphant Christian emperor, or should they withdraw to their estates? They chose to work with Constantine. And over the course of the next decade, I show how Roman aristocrats returned to the city, holding high positions in the administration of Constantine's new regime in the East and the West. <laughs> this collaboration entailed compromise, but it allowed senatorial aristocrats to secure the resurgence of Rome. The Senate in Rome remained the institution through which they conducted their political and social life, even as they worked with imperial administrators throughout the remainder of the empire. The fifth century, however, brought new political and military crises to Rome. So I devoted the next three chapters to the events used by historians to date the decline and fall of Rome, by which they mean most generally the end of the Western Roman Empire. Rome was sacked or occupied three times over the course of the fifth century. Most famous perhaps is the uh, 410 sack of the city, um, the first time it had been sacked in 800 years. It shocked contemporaries. And in a small city in North Africa, a Christian bishop, later to become St. Augustine, tried to dismiss earthly cities in his classic work, The City of God. Yet contemporaries attest to the rebounding of Rome within a few years. Augustine's protege, a man named Erosius, writing his history around 417, 
claimed that although that through God's efforts, the population of Rome and its spirit had recovered as if nothing had happened. So by focusing on how the political and military crises were used by Roman elites to rebuild their city, I offer an alternative framework to understand the last three centuries of the Western Roman Empire and its imperial capital. Although the fortunes of Rome's senators, emperors, generals, and bishops ebbed and flowed in a city which suffered population loss and declining wealth, absolutely. Nevertheless, the senatorial aristocracy remained at the center of the city's recovery. The resilience of Roman senatorial aristocrats, who time and again used their resources to fuel the city's resurgence in the aftermath of each crisis, is both meaningful and I find moving. It's the very definition of resilience used by social scientists who study society, societal responses to environmental shocks like plague and climate change. So in my book and in my ongoing research, I use this term resilience to consider how Roman elites adapted to the military and political crises that confronted Rome. To appreciate the resilience of the Roman central aristocracy, we have to understand that although the Roman Western Empire shrank over these centuries, that is, they lost control of northern and western provinces. Th that although they shrank, um, the western senatorial aristocracy of Italy and France or uh, ancient Gaul retained their social, political, and economic resources to a large degree. In fact, the shrinking of the western empire in the fifth century placed a renewed focus on Italy and on the city of Rome. Recent archaeological studies show that the senators increased their financial investments in large agricultural estates in southern Italy and Sicily. The senatorial aristocrats who owned these estates uh, were actually doing quite well because they were selling their products to cities in, it in Italy and to Rome. In short, Western senatorial aristocrats still had significant financial and political resources at their disposal through the fifth century. And the rise of an Eastern court in Constantinople did not diminish that situation. Politics then, as now, was global. Eastern emperors appreciated the wealth of the Western central aristocrats and courted them throughout the fifth century. But I think to really, to fully understand the resilience of the Roman central aristocracy, we also have to take into account this very fundamental fact that they themselves were the products of a culture in which competition for influence and prestige acted as a stimulant. Crises brought about changes that rendered politics in the late antique city more diffuse and variable. Personal relations played an even greater role than they had previously in winning power and building social networks that enabled material and political advancement. This competition energized rather than innovated central aristocrats. Their intervention also allowed then for the recovery of urban life. So for example, in the wake of the 410 sack, uh, they, senators were the ones who led a series of repairs to the this, to this city. Inscriptions attest that senator aristocrats in their role as urban prefects, kind of like mayors of Rome, that uh, were, were quick to rebuild areas of the city in the Roman Forum, um, on the baths on the Aventine Hill, a racetrack, all of these are rebuilt, and of course the Colosseum, uh, the remains of an inscription attest to this rebuilding in the wake of the 410 crisis. In contrast, some scholars have emphasized the growing power of the church and the bishops of Rome as central to the survival of Rome. Rome, after all, became a papal city. But I don't. I, for despite the growing wealth and influence of the church across the empire, the bishops of Rome remained weak civic leaders until much later, I would say the late sixth century. Indeed, the Bishop of Rome was not even called the Pope until the sixth century. And that is, in itself is a sign of the very slow growth of his civic influence in a city with a still active and still thriving 
secular senatorial aristocracy. In Rome, rather, the bishops focused on rebuilding the church, not the city at large. So to give you some sense of the, of the resilience of Roman senator aristocrats in relation to other elites uh, in Rome, I'm going to devote most of my talk tonight to the events surrounding the year 476. That's the date conventionally used for the final fall of Rome. Uh, and that's because in this year, uh, this young boy, Romulus, 14-year-old, emperor, um, mockingly called Augustulus, little Augustus, um, he was forced to abdicate his throne. And so, scholars say, last emperor, the end of Rome. But the story of 476 actually begins six years earlier. In 470, the new emperor, a fellow by the name of Anthemius, on your left, um, an experienced general, had come to Rome with the support of the Eastern Emperor. Remember that by this year, there were uh, two emperors normatively in the Roman Empire, one in the east in Constantinople, uh, which we can find, uh, well, Istanbul, modern Istanbul, um, and one in the west in, in Rome or in northern Italy in, in Ravenna. Uh, and so, uh, and as was typical for this time, Anthemius came to Rome uh, with uh, a large army of Roman and non-Roman forces. This was normative by the fifth century. He also possessed a large amount of gold. That's a gold coin here uh, with his image. Um, when he came, a number of Western senatorial aristocrats welcomed his arrival and held office under his rule. The key military general with whom Anthemius worked was a man by the name of Ricimer. Uh, we don't have an image of Ricimer. This is an early uh, year modern image of him. But Ricimer was the key general. Um, he was not Roman. He came from Gothic and Suevic origin. But he had spent his entire career at the top of the echelons of power as head of the military in the West. In fact, he was content with that, and he'd been content with that for some 15 years, controlling the military with the honorary title of patrician. He, uh, to secure Ricimer's loyalty, however, Anthemius decided that he would give his own daughter to marry him, and that way he would maintain his support. Their children, Ricimer's and Anthemius's daughters, would bring Ricimer a formal role in dynastic succession, or so it was hoped. In short, Ricimer would control the army, as he had done before, and he could wait for his son to hopefully become emperor. But this arrangement didn't last. Tensions between the general and the emperor grew, the marriage did not produce an heir, and when Anthemius grew dangerously ill, he alleged a conspiracy by friends of Ricimer, and then he executed them without a trial. Negotiations failed, and Ricimer marched on Rome and sieged Anthemius within the city's walls for five months. Anthemius counted as supporters a number of senators, magistrates and their retainers, as well as the populace at large. But this was a civil war. And we know names of senators, and I won't give them to you, who fought on Ricimer's side. Anywhere from 10 to 20,000 men fought for Ricimer, and probably the same number for Anthemius. The city itself became a battlefield. Ricimer was camped across the street, across the street, across the river, um, where the red arrow, arrows are, modern Trust Avery near the Vatican at St. Peter's. Um, and indeed, they fought a series of pitch battles all around the city, but the last decisive battle was there um, when uh, Ricimer's troops went into the uh, modern castle San Angelo, the mausoleum of Hadrian, of Hadrian uh, which he used as a fortress, which it still used, uh, remains till today as that. Ricimer's men hurled statues down at Anthemius's men and in the end, Anthemius's forces were overcome. The result, as Paul the Deacon later writes, was that Rome was devastated first by hunger and disease, and then was, quote, gravely ravaged by the greed of looters. Ricimer re 
um, released his men to loot the city at will. The fighting had been very severe, and it had divided families. This was a civil war, and it wrecked significant damage on the landscape. Castle San Angelo was uh, denuded of its statues, for one. Nevertheless, the willingness of senators to return to Rome laid the groundwork for the resurgence of the city. So in the aftermath of what one later bishop of Rome called civil madness, Roman senatorial and military elites acted quickly. The surviving senators returned to Rome and lent their support to the general Ricimer and the man whom he now designated as the next emperor, a fellow by the name of Anicius Olibrius. Olibrius was a wealthy senator from Rome from one of the most important families. The Anicii were one of the top four families across the empire with lands in the east and the west. So this was a brilliant choice by, uh, by Ricimer. The senators were willing to support this new government and to return soon after 472 rather than to retreat to their estates in Italy or in the east. And that willingness to return was key to their continuing influence in the decades that followed. Senatorial aristocrats had learned from past crises how to respond to recover their position and their property. And the victorious general Ricimer and the new Western emperor Olibrius were also motivated to seek senatorial support. It's interesting that neither Ricimer nor Olibrius took any uh, punishment on those senators who had supported the other side. And they even gave the now deceased Emperor Anthemius a very proper state burial. Therefore, they tried to uh, facilitate the reunification of the aristocracy behind their new government. And they succeeded. Even the unexpected death of Ricimer in August of 472 uh, did not uh, disrupt the, the plans for, for that Ricimer had had. The senators pledged loyalty to, the, to uh, Ricimer's uh, successor, who happened to be Ricimer's nephew, um, and they continued to support this arrangement, even when, surprisingly, Olibrius died very soon after, in November of 472. A new emperor uh, was recognized, Glacarius, by the Senate, um, and peace was preserved. So in the face of these very sudden turnovers, a unified Senate maintained its alliances with the military and started the work of restoring the city by 472. And one good example of that um, is preserved for us by inscriptions, carved writing. It comes from um, the area of the Roman Senate House, they're building off to the, uh, to the right, on the right hand there. Um, in an area identified as the Atrium of Minerva. Um, atrium was a porticus, a vestibule, and it was named after the goddess Minerva because there had been a statue of Minerva put there by the very first emperor, Augustus. So it, it was a, an area with great significance for senators because it had this long symbolic tradition. But I, what I find really interesting is the inscription that is preserved um, that, stated, that gives us the date for this repair. And this inscription no longer survives, but it was copied into a Renaissance book, and so we have it. Um, and it can be confidently reconstructed, and I will just translate for you, by a fellow by the name of Anicius Achilleus Aganantius Faustus, um, a very important fellow, of senatorial status and aristocrat of the highest rank, urban prefect, mayor, judge hearing imperial appeals, providing improvements, and completing the work for the happiness of the age. Um, so he, uh, indeed, was able to uh, repair this, uh, this area. Um, and he did it, um, even though he was obviously a, a Christian. Uh, this, the conscription also asserts what was a widespread ancient Mediterranean idea that this disaster had struck due to divine anger. And that's what the cause of the recent civil conflict um, was. Divine anger that there was civil war. The prefect who undertook this work, um, Anicius, you notice his first name, Anicius, Achilles, Aganatius, Faustus, 
also belonged to that same prominent established family of the Anikii, as did the first emperor, Olybrius. He would go on to have a long, illustrious career. But he wasn't alone in doing this repair. We know from inscriptions of several other repairs across the city that can be dated to the same period. So we hear another senator, uh, a member of a Roman family of the Petronii, um, who repaired the Baths of Constantine, for instance. And so the restoration of these public works expressed the personal engagement of these leading senators in the restoration of Rome uh, soon after 472. Roman senators also took on diplomatic roles in, after 472, and they did so to ensure the survival of Italy and their own ongoing role in administering it. So in quick succession, the, sec the Senate recognized a series of new military figures to maintain the security of Rome. And so actually in 476, the Senate made an alliance with a new general who appeared on the scene, a stronger and more politically savvy general by the name of Odoacer, not a Roman. Odoacer had defeated his opposition a general by the name of Orestes, in battles in northern Italy. So Rome was not touched by the fighting. Odoacer's defeat of Orestes led to the abdication of Orestes' son, that 14-year-old boy named Romulus. And so in 476, the date which is often used to identify the uh, date of the fall of the Roman, Roman Empire, Romulus abdicated and Odoacer was recognized by the Senate. In fact, um, uh, this was not the end of the Western Roman Empire from the perspective of the Senate or the senators in Rome. That's not how they saw it at all. Now they had made an alliance with uh, Odiacre, and so they sent ambassadors to the Eastern Emperor to assure him of their loyalty. They also told the Eastern Emperor, uh, uh, we are told, um, that there was no need for the, the emperor to send another uh, emperor, that one emperor in Constantinople was plenty. There was no need to have divided rule. You remain in Constantinople, and we, uh, the Senate, and as I said, uh, quote, had chosen Odoacer, a man of military and political experience, to safeguard their own affairs, ta pragmata, actually their things, literally their property and that the emperor should confer upon him, that is Odoacer, the rank of patrician, and entrust him with the government of Italy. That is, they wanted Odoacer to protect their affairs, their property, their social standing, their prestige. Clearly, the Senate had been working behind the scenes to instigate the exile of one emperor, Romulus, in favor of the more powerful general, so they could maintain their own positions in control of civic government. The Eastern Emperor did not accept this arrangement for his own reasons, but he didn't intervene either. There is little reason to suspect that the senators were unhappy with it. The Senate continued to meet and to educate laws and to make political decisions. Senators were chosen to high office to govern Italy. And we can see that if this, if we look at the man who took office in this period, and I won't go through this, but this is some of the work that I've done. Using inscriptions and textual remains, I've collected the information about who were the high officials under Odoacer. Uh, 16 of the possibly 87 civic officials can be securely dated. And of these men, uh, we can see a, a number of them who belong to very prominent families. Some, some nine are from powerful Roman families. And in green, you still see the name Decius. That's another important family, the Decii, um, along with the Anicii, uh, Simicus, uh, Anicius. These are the who's who of Roman elites, and they all held high office under Odoacer. So what I hope this part of my talk today has demonstrated is the resilience of Senator Aristogat in alliance with the military to restore Rome as the center of political and social power. It became apparent to aristocrats after 472 that it was no longer useful to have a military general sharing power with a resident Western emperor. This shared model of government uh, was no longer effective. 
certainly the two earlier fifth century crises of 410 and 455 that I analyzed in my book um, had, uh, had shown that the Senate and senators could govern and hold power without an imperial figure in the West. At the same time, many Western senatorial aristocrats wanted to maintain contact, contact with the Eastern Emperor and his court in Constantinople. Senators had land and family in the East, and they were happy to express their allegiance to the Emperor at a distance. Thus, the removal of a resident Western Emperor did not signal the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, not to the inhabitants of Rome or to those of Constantinople. So while I've emphasized the resilience of Roman elites in response to the crisis of 472, the catastrophist position that I mentioned earlier focuses on this event and other political and military crises as setting the city and its inhabitants on a virtually unavoidable downward spiral. This catastrophist approach has consistently underestimated the political and economic strength of Romans and their institutions, including the Senate. So, for example, rather than dismiss the delegation sent in 476 from the Senate of Rome to the Eastern Emperor, I argue that the embassy was an expression of the changed political goals of still powerful, still wealthy Western senators. Odoraca had allowed the son of Orestes to go into exile, and he ruled Italy as a king, even though the Eastern Emperor didn't recognize him. But the senators played, as I've shown, a pivotal political role in negotiating this new order. And as I've also shown, the Senate supported Ardoacre and collaborated with him to secure their continued administration of Rome in Italy. So they kept on holding high offices and running Italy. New men also came to Rome, eager for offices in the years after 476. In fact, the city and the new political order offered opportunities for men of all sorts, new and old senators. Peace also offered landowners the opportunity to recover their economic losses. Because Roman senators in the Senate were active political players in the last decade of the fifth century, powerful military figures and the Eastern Emperor sought their support. When the Eastern Emperor, uh, in fact, decided that he could no longer put up with Odiacre, he chose another general, um, the Ostrogothic uh, king named Theodoric, and sent him to Italy in 489 to remove Odriacher from power. Theodoric sought the support of the Senate. And indeed, he fought Odriacher in battles in northern Italy. Um, only after Odriacher had suffered two defeats uh, was, was it up to the Senate to decide whose uh, general they would support. The Senate, uh, when Odaka requested entry into Rome, the Senate refused him. They decided that Theodoric was a better bet and that a more effective protector. So once again, the Senate recognized Theodoric, and once again, they sent uh, an envoy to Constantinople to ask the Eastern Emperor to recognize Theodoric as the king of the Ostrogoths in Italy. And by 498, the Eastern Emperor did just that. So the government continued. Uh, senator aristocrats continued to compete for office, attaining social, political, economic, uh, and religious honor in Rome through their engagement in civic office and in the Senate. But what about the church and the bishops? The institution and its leaders that come to the forefront of most general studies of this period and is so very dominant in the continuous view of this period. It was really the church. My research so shows that the bishops and the church did not attain the influence nor the wealth to dominate civic society in Rome until much later in the sixth century. That is not for another uh, 100 years after 476. Certainly after each crisis, the bishops sought to rebuild their churches and their con communities. And senatorial aristocrats were critically important in these efforts as well, acting not just as donors, but also taking leading roles in religious controversies. We know, for example, of senatorial aristocrats who were personally engaged in pressuring bishops to punish clergy who sold their charitable gifts. 
bishops were involved in the choice of, of succession of the next, excuse me, senators were involved in the choice of the success of bishops. And after 476, the senators played a key role in supporting the Bishop of Rome against the Eastern Emperor and the Eastern Bishop of Constantinople, a fellow by the name of Acacius. Acacius and the Eastern Emperor wanted the West to accept a new formulation about the unity of the divine and the human natures of Christ. Rather than accept this new formulation by the bishop named Acacius, in 483, the bishop of Rome, Felix, excommunicated Acacius in what is seen as the very first schism between the Eastern and Western churches. It's known today by the name of the bishop of Constantinople, the Acacian schism. The schism lasted for 30 years, but throughout this time, the bishop of Rome had the support of Western central aristocrats who served not only as papal envoys to Constantinople, but also as advocates of the bishop's position to other bishops, to the clergy, and, and to the kings of Italy. So it should not be a surprise, I think, that in an effort to get the Bishop of Rome to accept the Acacian formulation, the Eastern Emperor in 508 sent a letter to the Senate requesting the Senate to convince the Bishop of Rome to go along with it. The Senate wrote back with a polite no. Their actions protected the Bishop of Rome, and 10 years later, in 508, the Eastern Bishop uh, did finally back down, and the schism ended. But the reliance of the Bishop of Rome in this instance on senators and the action of the Senate over these decades altered the balance of power between the aristocrats and the clergy in Rome, further limiting the influence of the bishops in civic matters. So despite the rhetoric of later pro-papal documents, about the controlling dominant role of the Bishop of Rome. My research underscores that the bishops needed senatorial support and thus remained weak civic leaders into the sixth century. So did the city of Rome fall? And if so, when? Not in 476, as I've argued, when Romulus abdicated. In truth, the notion of 476 as the fall of Rome was first attested by 6th century Eastern writers under the Emperor Justinian. And they came up with that date as a way of justifying Justinian's war on Italy to recover Italy for the East. So this observation leads me to the other common idea about the fall of Rome. Namely, the city was destroyed over the course of that 20-year war that Justinian fought to regain control of Italy from the Ostrogoths from around 534 to 552. Absolutely, the war was destructive of the city's physical infrastructure, its population, and its wealth. Rome was sieged three times and sacked twice over the course of that war. But I argue that the war itself was not the final nail in Rome's coffin. Indeed, after the Gothic War, Roman senators, the clergy, and the Eastern ministers were poised to return. We know the names of several of the aristocrats and clergy who had received favors during the war for supporting Justinian, and they expected to return. These aristocrats owned properties in Sicily and Sardinia and southern Italy, and they were well positioned to reclaim their status and wealth. Many of them had spent time in Constantinople, um, where they were safe from the warfare. After the fighting had ground to a halt, a weary Senate and the surviving senators, along with the Pope now and clergy of Rome, looked forward to a period of reconstruction. The Eastern Romans, whom I call Byzantines, and we now call Byzantines for simplicity's sake, had styled themselves as liberators of the state. Italo Romans didn't challenge this view as they positioned themselves to restore the city and their roles in society after the end of, of the war. Um, and indeed, uh, they returned to Rome just as they had in the past. And there were signs of rebuilding in Rome soon after the war. Um, this is uh, Justinianic Italy after the war uh, on your left. We know from inscriptions that their walls were rebuilt by uh, the general, uh, Justinian's general, that bridges were uh, repaired along the Tiber River and the Anio River. And we have evidence that four of the 14 aqueducts were repaired. So repairs took place um, as soon after the war. People came back. 
Yet despite these infrastructure investments, the Romans were surely disappointed with the reconstruction period that followed the war, in part, or in large part, because the system of administration that the Eastern Emperor put in place undercut the political influence of Western senatorial aristocrats. Under Justinian, it was the Eastern military men and Eastern administrators who took on the positions of rebuilding Rome. It was the Eastern uh, administrators who took the high positions in the civic government. Eastern officials now were collecting taxes. So, um, in fact, as in other provinces, Justinian now turned to the bishops directly to help govern Italy, and this was new. For the first time in laws of 454, bishops were directly involved in actually choosing provincial governors for Italy. That the replacement of Westerners by Eastern administrators was a conscious policy on the part of the Byzantine rulers of Italy is clear if we consider that Byzantine emperors could have chosen Westerners to administer Italy. And even if they chose to rely on trusted Easterners for their high offices, the Eastern Emperor could have elevated senators to, to high uh, positions and prestige. Or they could have granted the senators honorary consulships, as happened in the East. But they did not. Justinian clearly did not want to encourage an active central aristocracy as an opposition to him, nor did he want to encourage an active political center in the Senate in Rome. And uh, the set of laws that Justinian passed makes this clear. Um, he allowed the, the uh, landowners to travel back and forth between Italy and Rome, but he changed the law, the residential requirements. It used to be that Roman senators had to have a Pieter Tier in Rome. This was omitted from Justinian's laws. And so this discouraged uh, Roman senators from actually investing in the city of Rome and in houses in Rome. Um, it's part of the same um, process of fracturing the Western senator aristocracy that Justinian um, supported. Residential requirements for senators had been in place under the Ostrogoths, but they were not in place once Justinian decided to reconstruct Italy. It would seem that many of the Roman senator aristocrats who, may, who, um, who had returned, uh, in fact, many of them left. Um, they, and that is based on my analysis of the letters of, and writings of Pope Gregory, who was a bishop of Rome in the very last decade of the sixth century, from around 590 to 604. Most of the men and women that Gregory mentioned in his letters and in his dialogues had retreated to their estates in southern Italy and Sicily. They chose to exert their political influence from afar and were increasingly less involved in the political life of the Senate of Rome. In fact, these senators could um, live on their estates and uh, exercise political influence without having come to Rome. And this is a really massive shift in, in habitation patterns. In fact, the last recorded political function of the Senate of Rome is uh, functions are, are emblematic of the changes that I've been describing. In 578 and again 579 to 80, two embassies went from the Senate of Rome to the emperor in Constantinople. They were asking for men and money to fight against new invaders, the Lombards. The senators did not get the men they requested. And I think most tellingly, in 593, when the Lombard king came to Rome for money, it was the pope, not the senate or senators, who negotiated the payments that saved the city. It may not be surprising that the last known act of the Senate of Rome, the ceremonial acclamation of the icons of the Byzantine emperor Phocas and his wife, took place in the St. John the Lateran Basilica in Rome in 603. It did not take place in the Senate or the Roman Forum. And this, I think, is a very fitting switch, transformation in the way power was being um, manifested. After 603, we don't hear any more about the Senate as uh, an institution, nor is Rome famed as a center of central aristocratic power. Uh, indeed, even uh, as I noted earlier, 
In my view, the end of the Senate represents the final fall of Rome as an ancient city. That is one in which the ideal of civic society inspired sanitary aristocrats and upwardly mobile provincials to serve the state to attain senatorial status. The Senate's passing is documented on the ground by the transformation of the Roman Senate House shown here in that slide from the 18th century. Um, that transformation of the Roman Senate House in the Roman Forum into a church, the Church of St. Hadrian. It was done by Pope Honorius um, uh, and under his pontificate in the seventh century. The doors from the Senate House were also moved to St. John the Lateran, the home of the Pope. And these are the doors that are shown on my book as, as emblematic of this shift. But this was not until the seventh century. In fact, um, this act of donating the Senate House to, in, to a church is still more meaningful because Honorius, the Pope of Rome, was from one of the last of the Roman central aristocratic families. Rather than serve the state, Honorius served the church. And for me, this marks the beginning of papal Rome. So final reflections. All these, all their lessons from the Western Roman Empire for our country today. And I will be brief. Um, I am moved by how Rome's senatorial elite, though working in competition with one another, were able to marshal their resources after the most extreme military and political crises throughout these centuries. I'm not saying that this oligarchy was the best system for political government, um, and far from it. But the creative resilience of Roman senators and their willingness to collaborate across political and religious divisions, be it with the Christian Constantine or the Aryan Gothic Swabian general Ricimer, shows tremendous tenacity, adaptiveness, and resilience in the most difficult times. I am moved as well by how often Roman central aristocrats made honest assessments of the real needs of the city and the times. Only by truthfully judging weakness and weighing culpability do the central aristocrats move on to rebuild the city. One vignette is very telling. After the sack of Rome by Alaric and his Goths in 410, the Senate had sat in judgment of one of their own. The Senator Attalus had thrown in his fate with Alaric and the Goths and had usurped the role of emperor. Attalus was later returned to Rome for punishment for his actions. The then Western emperor made a public display of his guilt, and the senators approved the punishment, the cutting off of the thumb and forefinger of the traitor analyst, the digits that were needed to make a public speech. So too, would our leaders do, do well to reflect on these Roman exemplars? Politicians should publicly acknowledge their responsibility for failure, be it failing to resist misinformation about, about elections or the corrupting influence of political action packs. Only if they and we, the people, can acknowledge failures and accept the consequences can we move on to take the necessary steps to rebuild our cities and our country. The willingness to apply one's resources for the good of the state was not, for the Romans, a selfless task. As I said, competition for office, for status, for social honor, led Roman senators time and again to invest themselves as well as their fortunes in the rebuilding of their city, its physical infrastructure as well as its social fabric. Senators worked with religious leaders, with the military, with imperial officials, and with each other to restore Rome. The idea of Rome lived on to inspire action and sacrifice, even if the daily reality of living in the city brought challenges and changes that made life there less secure than in the past. The dedication of Rome's civic leaders explained the longevity of Rome as an ancient city. We might hope that our civic leaders would be equally dedicated to the spirit of collaboration in the face of the momentous task before us as a country. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor, for the amazing talk. It was incredibly interesting, and we will now be transitioning to the Q&A portion of the evening. So for those of you who have questions to ask, please come up to the mic and ask. Um, when you do, make sure to introduce yourself, say your name, 
your year as well as your major. Hi, I'm Kimmy. Um, I'm a senior at CMC majoring in classical studies and government. Um, I'm really interested in like um, funerary practices and like depictions and stuff like that. Um, between like Odegar and like Theodosia, the Theodoric, Theodoric, sorry. That's um, a so between those two, and then you know before like 476, do you s like is there any evidence for like a shift in depicting people on stuff like um, sarcophagi or? Are people like changing artistic styles or representations of themselves? Are we seeing pants or like are still are people still in like togas? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Kimmy. That's a great question. Um, one of the really intriguing changes uh, and, uh, is the ways in which non-Romans, i.e., barbarians, uh, from a Roman perspective, become so much a part of the landscape. Um, and you know uh, the uh, um, and the wearing of pants, which is something that barbarians wore, um, which also is what the military wore. So we see uh, we have laws saying you can't wear pants in the Roman Forum because it's not appropriate, right? um, and we see um, Romans dressing in military dress uh, in the from the fourth century on. So the higher status of both Roman generals, barbarians, is manifested by their clothing to some degree. So we do see changes in the way people dress and depictions of it as a sign of their status greatly. Um, in terms of burials, by now everybody is um, burying their dead. We don't have cremation anymore from the fourth century on. It's one of those massive shifts that happens, shifts that happens in the third century, and I don't think anybody has a really good explanation for it. But certainly after Christianity um, becomes more widespread over the fourth and fifth centuries, um, neither the uh, Nicene Christians nor the Arian Christians do anything but bury their dead. So, so that becomes standard. Um, yeah, it's a very big topic. There are lots more that I could say, but uh, I think I'll, I'll, I'll end there. But, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, my name is Desmond. I'm a recent graduate with a major in government. Um, oh. I wanted to ask one thing you mentioned at the beginning, a legal system being part of Rome's legacy, and certainly about half of the world has civil law systems based on you know, the Napoleonic Code going back all the way to Justinian and even earlier in, in law. But you know, somewhere around <clears throat> another half of the world has common law systems that sort of arise in contrast to that. And um, I've seen the thesis that medieval thinkers believed that there was a problem with Rome's legal system and that inventing a whole new system, common law, was a way to avoid Rome's fate. Do you disagree with that thesis based on you know, disputing the, the idea that Rome sort of fell abruptly or, uh, or do you agree with it? Thank you, that's a great question. Uh, I, I think that the medieval right, uh, uh, or the, the, the people who, who did not adopt Roman laws as their basis um, for a variety of reasons. Right? And, uh, the continuity of Roman law by barbarian law codes suggests that it, it wasn't a sort of a completely um, conscious decision on the part of, of various medieval, uh, of uh, various um, areas of the Western Empire. So um, it's often, often well to say that even though Rome no longer is, it's left us our laws, Latin is, you know, uh, 55, 65% of, percent of English, so it lives on in that way. Um, and I think that's true. Uh, so I, I would, um, the medieval, cho the choices by, uh, in English common law, come out of a very different system and structure. How conscious they were, that's a really a hard question to answer. Um, but I do think that um, the, the jurisprudence of, um, 
the legal systems of the Romans, the Justinian Code has huge impact in, in the Western Europe for sure and still does till today. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, my name is Homer Livingston. I'm a junior studying economics here. Hi. I wanted to ask you kind of a two-parter about the, the end of your presentation, the lessons for America. You mentioned that, for example, our politicians should be looking at curbing the influence of PACs and things of that nature. From listening to your presentation, it would, I would have had the thought that we should almost be encouraging uh, <laughs> elite money and wealth, right? Be because where, where, where do you have the incentive to keep rebuilding if you have less and less control over the co direction that your country is going? And then how do you reconcile that with the rise of kind of a, a global elite class that is no longer meeting in places like Rome and instead meets in, you know, Davos to talk about the fate of not only their country but the world almost? Yeah. Great. Thank you. That's really interesting. Um, uh, I, I, I think that the um, elite in Rome uh, or the central elite were in many ways um, um, encouraged, as I said, it wasn't completely selfless, right? Um, and they did involve themselves and they did put their money into rebuilding the city, but they also benefited from it. Um, and that's where the PACs, I think, would be somewhat different. The PACs are not as, uh, they have that particular interest, whereas the senators had a series of civic values, and it wasn't, yes, to help themselves, but also they had an ideal of Rome and what government should be like, and that I think is would be my difference, my differentiation there. It's a good point, though. Um, um, yeah, I, I think the fragmentation of elites away from Rome and Italy is is not a, a good thing. And similarly, in the modern world, the willingness of elites to move their money where they want to meet in Davos means that the willingness to support um, local sites or, or regions um, has declined. I mean, that's, that can have negative consequences, as it did in, in Rome, I think, in the seventh century. Thank you. Yeah, great question. Um, please join me in thanking Dr. Salzman for the amazing presentation today. Um, it was an incredibly interesting talk, and I'm sure we're all so glad. Um, to have you join us. Thank you all for coming and joining us at the Athenaeum today. Oh yeah, that was, that was a sign to clap. That was my bad. Um, and then thank you all for joining us today at the Athenaeum. We hope to see you all soon again.